Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hello and welcome. I'm Carol Fleck, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I'm pleased to bring you today's ADHD experts presentation titled ADHD Grandfamilies, Grandparents Raising Neurodivergent Grandkids. Leading today's presentation is Dr. Caroline Mendel from the Child Mind Institute. Dr. Mendel is the Senior Director of Clinical Services for School and Community Programs and a psychologist in the ADHD and Behavior Disorder Center at Child Mind. She specializes in the assessment and treatment of youth with ADHD, disruptive behavior, and other co-occurring conditions. She is skilled in behavioral parent training approaches and is a certified parent-child interaction therapist. She also has experience providing evidence-based interventions, including cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal psycho psychotherapy, and dialectical behavior therapy. In today's webinar, we'll help grandparents better understand why children with ADHD exhibit certain behaviors, and we'll provide you with proven practical strategies that will encourage positive behavior and help you set the stage for success. We'd like to begin today's webinar by asking this poll question to our live audience. What is the most surprising, valuable, or eye-opening lesson that your grandchild has taught you about parenting? Submit your answer in the text box under the video player. And while you do that, I'll point out that live participants may submit questions anytime during the live event. To download the slides, click on the event resources section of your webinar screen. If you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you'll receive about an hour after the live broadcast. A transcript of today's event will be made available in the coming week. If you're listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 452 to access the slides, the video replay, the certificate of attendance option, and the webinar transcript. And if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude, to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe. Sign up now to receive our summer issue where we celebrate moms and how much she takes on to care for her family. You'll find a self-care guide for her, for her well-being, plus a blueprint for dads and other male role models to help boys learn social skills and make lasting friendships. Also, an expert in neurodevelopmental pediatrics shares his advice on dietary supplements that may ease ADHD symptoms. We'll tell you which supplements and the recommended dosage. We've also asked readers how they disguise the taste of supplements like fish oil for their kids, and we got brilliant recipes and ideas. Plus, we have a stellar roundup of audiobooks to keep your school-age readers invested and engaged this summer no sitting required. Sign up for Attitude Magazine today for your family or to share with a teacher or a loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. So without further ado, I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Caroline Mendel. Thank you so much for joining us today and for leading this discussion. Thank you so much for that introduction and for having me here today. I'm so excited to be speaking with you. As, as you all know, it takes a village to raise a child. So having everyone in the child's life uh, learning these strategies and thinking about how to support their grandchild with ADHD is incredibly important. I'm joining you from the Child Mind Institute. We are a national nonprofit dedicated to transforming the lives of children and families struggling with mental health and learning disorders. And we do this in three ways. One is through research, next through evidence-based clinical care in our offices in New York City and the San Francisco Bay Area, as well as in the school communities surrounding those offices, and through public education. We have a resource-rich website, childmind.org, and we engage in other initiatives to help end stigma and misinformation surrounding mental health and learning disorders. In terms of what I'll be covering today, I'll be going over the evolution of ADHD uh, very briefly, and how ADHD can impact a child's life, just to ground us and make sure that 
uh, we all have the same information about ADHD before heading into the bulk of the presentation, which are practical strategies that you can use with your grandchildren to improve, improve your relationship, navigate challenging daily routines, avoid common pitfalls like yelling and escalating threats, and helping your grandchild follow rules and directions. So as you can see, ADHD has been around in some form. The, the construct has been understood for, for a long time. We have the, our current understanding is that it is ADHD with three different symptom presentations. Um, but as you can see, it has gone through many different names and iterations over time. And in fact, some people may still be familiar with the term ADD, uh, which is a, a term that was utilized in a prior DSM in 1980, and now we've, we've uh, changed that now to be ADHD with three different symptom presentations. And those are the predominantly inattentive type. So this is when um, children exhibit difficulties staying focused, sustaining their attention on tasks that might require more effort, difficulties with organization, losing items, planning tasks, et cetera. Um, then we have the more hyperactive impulsive symptoms, and these are things like being fidgety, um, having difficulty raising your hand before speaking, interrupting, running about or climbing on things more frequently than peers. And then there's the combined type. There are kids who exhibit symptoms from both of those categories. Um, we often see that girls present with the inattentive type more frequently than boys, or that sometimes they are actually underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed because it can be more challenging to pick up on some of those symptoms. And uh, of course, in a classroom or in a home, some of those hyperactive impulsive symptoms may be more interfering. We also know that these ADHD symptoms can vary across development. So we, in preschool age, we might expect kids to have more primary difficulty with hyperactivity and impulsivity. And this makes sense because kids are at that age are just more active and kids with ADHD will be displaying those symptoms at a greater rate than their peers. By school age, this is when we see the challenges with inattention come about more frequently. And this also makes sense because kids are expected to read for longer. They're expected to sit in their desks and raise their hand and engage in longer uh, homework assignments and be able to keep track of their materials and bring them home for homework and bring them back to hand them in. By adolescence, we still see those difficulties with inattention, but then we see the impulsive behavior um, more so in terms of risky behavior. So things like reckless driving or substance use um, may, may come about in adolescence. And then we see that ADHD does persist into adulthood in about two thirds of cases. So in general, ADHD is a chronic condition and it is not something that you wanna sort of take a gamble on and wait and see. You want to be addressing it as, as early as you can to be able to help your child or grandchild uh, be successful and reach their potential. This is a graph just depicting rates of ADHD over time. As you can see, the rates are increasing and now we're hovering at around 10%. And it's hard to know if this is because there actually is a higher incidence of the disorder or uh, very likely that there is just better tools to recognize the disorder through the work of attitude and others, there's been great efforts to destigmatize the uh, getting help for ADHD and other mental health conditions. So people are more willing to raise their hand and say, "Hey, I'd like some some support." Um, I know at least anecdotally in my practice, when I'm providing a child with a diagnosis of ADHD, they will parents will often say to me, "Oh, you're really describing me, but I never received this diagnosis." Um, so, so certainly something to, to keep in mind, um, you know, as, as we're, we're going through the rest of the presentation. I wanted to touch on three key facts or ideas uh, about ADHD. The first is that ADHD is a real disorder. It is a real condition. It is a neurodevelopmental disorder that is brain-based. So this is not something that has been caused by parenting or any other factors, although there are wonderful things that you can do as caregivers to help support a child with ADHD. 
The second is that it is common. As we just saw, it's affected and estimates can vary, but roughly 10% of children and adolescents have been diagnosed with ADHD. And finally, that ADHD is treatable through a combination of medication and behavioral intervention that might include behavioral parent training or work with caregivers, work with teachers, school consultation, behavioral school consultation, or other intensive programs like a summer treatment program. Those can be quite effective in combination with medication to address ADHD. And how does ADHD impact a child's life? We see this in, in many different ways. Given the, the different symptom presentations and how things can change over the course of a child's life, the way that we see ADHD impact their life may change over time, but these are just some, some ways that you might see this showing up in your grandchild's life. The first is in their academic work, whether it's in school, being able to focus on the teacher, completing their classwork, completing their homework, being able to remember to bring those materials back home, et cetera. Completing daily routines. We hear this a lot that kids with ADHD have difficulty moving through routines, even if those routines don't change, whether it be the morning routine or the evening routine or getting through homework uh, that can require significant effort or frustration on the part of the caregiver as well. We see difficulties with peer and family relationships. The family piece I'll get to in a bit, but in terms of peers, uh, kids with ADHD will often interrupt their peers. They may not be fully attending in a conversation. They may barge in on a game. Um, so these are things that can impact how well they can get along with their peers. They have difficulty remembering and following rules, holding that information in their mind and being able to execute on it can be quite challenging. And it often can feel like purposeful non-compliance or defiance, but it is just that it is difficult for the ADHD brain to um, be able to follow through on that multi-step direction. We often see that there is what we call a co-occurring uh, or comorbid disorder of oppositional defiance disorder that, that can often come along with ADHD. But a lot of times this, again, is just due to the, the child having ADHD. And again, there's lots that we can do as parents and caregivers to help promote their compliance. And then finally, uh, difficulties with organizational skills can impact many of the areas that I mentioned before, especially academics. And I'd like to touch on how ADHD sim symptoms impact you as caregivers. These are common themes that I hear from families. It can be incredibly frustrating. Parents or caregivers might have thoughts or feelings of incompetence, that they're doing something wrong or don't know how to parent their child. They may go to one of two extremes. Either they escalate their reaction because they have to say it 10 times or say it very loud or give a very big threat um, of, you know, taking away the iPad or something in order to get done what they want their child to do. Or on the flip side, they may give up or give in. So if you're having difficulty getting them to turn off their iPad and you don't want to get into a physical um altercation about it and try to, you know, physically remove it, you may say, okay, you know what, I'm just stay on your iPad, I'm, I'm going to go into the other room. And, and we see kind of going back and forth between these two um, poles, because it is reinforcing that behavior. So the child is learning, hey, if I just keep escalating, I'll get what I want. And you may also be learning, okay, if I escalate my reactions, I get what I want. And a lot of the strategies that I'll go over today will be designed to help you not reach those level of escalations, but still uh, get your child to be able to be successful and do the things that you're hoping that they'll do. And then finally, I often hear that uh, parents or caregivers are having difficulty enjoying time with their child. So they're spending so much effort just trying to get them from point A to point B um, or some of the behavior is starting to get more oppositional or more challenging, and it can be hard to just be and play and, and have fun. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, too. Before I dive into the strategies, I just want to remind you, given all those frustrations that I just mentioned, that challenging behavior requires just as much support as anxiety or depression, but it inspires nowhere near the same level of empathy. And I think it's important to remember that when your grandchild is 
having a difficult time. It is them having a difficult time because of their ADHD and the things that are more challenging for them, not because they are doing something wrong or because you are doing something wrong. So have that compassion both with them and with yourself and think about how you can help support them and uh, and meet them where they are. All right, so we're going to dive into the strategies here. And uh, just to, to ground our discussion, I'm going to talk about the optimal uh foundation for uh, parenting or caregiving in this case. And uh, when we think about parenting or caregiving, there's a continuum. We have permissive, a permissive style, which is, you know, letting the kid do what they want, have the run of the show. And then there's more authoritarian, which is, I think some people would refer to it as more old school. Um, it has more of a disciplinarian, you know, because I said so type angle. And then where we want to be is right in the middle. We want authoritative. We want to have a balance of warmth and limit setting. And this is a style that what this parenting style was identified by Diana Baumrind in 1966. So um, it has just taken a little while, I think, to, to take hold and to kind of um, become more of the way of being in society. Um, but certainly achieving this balance is very important because you want to have that warm, open relationship with your grandchild. It's important to be able to foster open communication, to show interest and acceptance in what they like and what they're good at, to have one-on-one -on -one time where the child can be in charge and can have that chance to you know, show you the things that they want to do and providing frequent praise and positive reinforcement. Those are things that will build a trusting relationship that will help you with limit setting. So when it does come time to limit set, the child is much more likely to understand where you're coming from, to wanna help you out, to do the things that you're asking them to do. But we do wanna have limit setting. Again, we don't wanna be in that permissive state. We, it's important to have consistent routines, clear rules and expectations, Monitoring of behavior is very important, whether it's you know, where your teenager is going out with friends or what somebody is doing on social media. When we have that watchful eye, that can be a protective factor. And then consistent but incremental consequences. So again, we're achieving this balance. And uh, layered on top of this, when we're parenting kids with ADHD, we also want to think about important factors for the ADHD brain. These include structure, consistency, salience, motivation, and stimulation. And it's important to, to think about those things because kids with ADHD really benefit from the immediate reinforcement, from receiving that high dose of input. And uh, when, when they're able to receive rewards, receive your praise uh, in, the, in those moments at the, what Barclay, Russell Barkley calls the point of performance, that's how we can help them be successful. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go through specific strategies. This is our hierarchy of behavioral techniques. And the basic premise here is that you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. So you want to be more proactive than reactive. And a lot of times families come to me and they say, help me, I need help when my kid is having a meltdown about this. What do I do in that moment? And I say, let's start at the beginning. Let's see how we can even prevent that meltdown from happening in the first place. So we start with these strategies of setting the stage for success. And what do I mean by that? These are things that you can do in the environment to make it more likely that your child or grandchild with ADHD will be successful. And some ideas here are to create and establish specific routines. These are checklists or visual reminders of what they're expected to do. Again, it may seem like they should know that they wake up, brush their teeth, get dressed, go eat breakfast, and get their backpack and go out the door. But having that visual reminder is can be very grounding and being able to check it off and receive that reinforcement at each stage in terms of your attention and praise can be very helpful. You want to help break bigger tasks or long-term projects down. So if you tell your grandchild to go clean their room, that feels like Mount Everest to them. And it is a very big task. Break it down into smaller steps. So it's time to clean your room. Please start by putting the cars in the bin. Um, 
Also with long-term projects, because of those difficulties with organizational skills that I mentioned, being able to have different steps that they need to take, the time estimates that it will take to complete them can help them, again, get from point A to point B with that extra structure and support. If you're helping with homework, if you're in charge of the, the after-school routine, make sure that your grandchild has a dedicated workspace that is free from distractions and clean and they know exactly what they need and help them set up organizational systems that work for them. These are things that they should have uh, some buy-in to use, and we can talk about rewarding their use of them later. Um, but it, there's, it's not one size fits all. It will depend on your child's needs. Using visual timers, there's one example here, um, is very helpful in externalizing time for kids with ADHD. So the, the concept of time is much more difficult for them. Being able to estimate time or understanding how much time has elapsed can be challenging for kids with ADHD. So having it right there for them to visually see can be helpful in completing a task like brushing teeth or completing homework or even doing screen time if you want to say, okay, you have 30 minutes and you can watch as the time goes down. You want to have clear and consistent expectations and consequences. Kids with AD, all kids, but especially kids with ADHD, benefit from having those expectations repeated to them right before the activity. So let's say you're going to go to the playground. You want to remind them we're going to the playground. Remember, it's important to ask before joining a game to wait your turn for the slide. And if you want to check out another part of the playground, come and ask me first, right? You want to think through what are the things that could go wrong and what should I um, let them know is my expectation beforehand. And then you also want to be having those consistent consequences uh, laid out beforehand, because if you don't know exactly what the consequence is for a particular behavior and you're feeling nervous or frustrated in a particular moment, you may say something that you later regret and can't follow through on. So we want to make sure that there is that consistency uh, there for your child or child. Next, you want to provide transition warnings. And this is a great thing to do, especially if the child is, let's say, ending a preferred activity like screen time. You have 10 minutes left. You have five minutes left. You have one minute left. Okay, please turn off the iPad. Um, it is not going to be a guarantee that they will be able to, you know, shut it off and hand it to you immediately, but it will increase the likelihood that they will do this successfully. Just think about it. If you had to immediately go to a meeting or, you know, if you were writing an email and you had to, to get up and do something without any warning, it would be a little jarring for you. So we want to make sure that we're giving kids that time. Using when-then statements is a way to encourage the behaviors that you want to see. And you're basically saying when you complete this activity that you may not be so into, a less preferred activity, then you get a preferred activity or item. Um, so something like when you finish your homework, then you can play video games. When you finish your dinner, then you can get dessert. And again, it's without having to set up a formal reward system, which we'll go into how to do that a little bit. Um, this is a nice way to still be able to reward the behaviors that might be more challenging or not as exciting for your grandchild. You also want to give choice when possible. So all kids love to have some say in the matter. They, especially kids with ADHD, feel like they're constantly being told what to do or constantly having their behavior criticized or um, under the microscope. And so being able to provide that choice and give them some agency can be really powerful. And you can give this at times where you're, you're good with it, right? So if you're doing homework, you say, it's homework time. Do you want to start with math or writing, it will be more likely that they will enter into homework time with you if they're given some choice in it. If you're brushing teeth, do you want to use the strawberry toothpaste or the mint toothpaste, right? It's another place where either way, the teeth are getting brushed, but they had some say. And then finally, you want to model the behaviors that you want to see. Kids really pick up on what they see. And if you are expecting that your grandchild will speak to you in a calm tone, then you should speak to them in a calm tone. If you're expecting that your grandchild will not be on his phone at the dinner table, then you should also have your phone away at the dinner table. Um, so just a, a helpful reminder that you know, the way that you act is also really important for as teachable moments for your grandkids. 
these are just some routine examples so you can see kind of what some of those routines might look like. Again, these are going to be uh, tailored to what your grandchild needs, but it has a visual typically. Um, sometimes I will put these time estimates and then pair it with that visual timer. And uh, again, just sort of helping helping the, the child kind of move through that part of the day. You can either just use it as a, as a checklist, as a tool of knowing what comes next, or you can also pair it with some kind of reinforcement. So for example, if you finish your morning routine and you're out the door by 745, then you get to pick the song in the car or something like that. This is a sample homework checklist. Again, you would tailor it to what your grandchild needs, but these are some typical behaviors that a child with ADHD might have difficulty with and that might impact their academic functioning. All right, so our next step in the hierarchy of behavioral techniques is positive attending and active ignoring. And this is uh, really important for, for all kids, but especially kids with ADHD, again, because they really benefit from that in the moment feedback and having, having that reinforcement, you know, nice and, and strong and big and right when the behavior is happening. And I want you to think about your grandchild's behavior like a garden of behaviors where we have the flowers, the positive behaviors, the weeds are the negative behaviors. And your attention is like sunshine and fertilizer. So you want to be putting that sunshine and fertilizer onto the flowers rather than the weeds. And unfortunately, our standard way of operating is to put our attention onto those weeds, onto those negative behaviors, because we're problem solvers. And those behaviors can be irritating or problematic in some way. So if your grandchild is whining, you're going to be more likely to attend to the whining. If they are um, having difficulty that you said, no, you can't have um, candy in the grocery store and they're throwing a tantrum, you're going to try to solve that problem because it's uncomfortable to have other people around you observing this behavior. Um, so it, it really takes time to unlearn this greater attention to the negative behavior, and instead learning to give more attention to the positive behaviors. So what the, the challenge here is that you are going to ignore negative behavior, nothing dangerous or destructive that you would have to intervene and make sure that everybody is safe, um, but you wanna be ignoring negative behavior so that it reduces, it's not getting that sunshine and fertilizer and instead paying attention to positive behavior so that that behavior grows and strengthens. We call this being a detective for positive behavior. So being able to be on the lookout for those behaviors that uh, you want to see more of. And what do I mean when I say attend to those behaviors? I mean, give it praise. And when we provide praise, we want to make sure that we're providing specific praise. So not just good job, but Good job getting started on your math homework. Thank you so much for calmly accepting when I told you no. And you want to be focused on what we call positive opposite behaviors, um, which are the behaviors that you want to see instead of the problem behavior. So think about which behaviors are challenging for your grandchild and what's the behavior that you want to see instead. And then what behavior could I praise and when are the situations when I can praise that? Again, we want to make sure that, that this praise is big, bold, and immediate. And the way that we can do that is by being really enthusiastic, making sure we're sincere, adding uh, some sort of nonverbal reinforcer, like a hug, a high five, or a pat on the back. And then we want to use these at a high dose. So for every direction or correction that you provide, for example, please uh, sit, it's homework time, please sit down then you wanna be praising three things, at least three things. So thank you so much for sitting right away. Great job taking out your math notebook. Wow, I am so impressed with how you got started on homework so quickly. And then you're ready to give another correction if you need to. Um, and you wanna focus on specific, any behavior is good to praise, but you wanna focus specifically on the behaviors that you want to increase. So um, here is here are some examples of some positive opposite behaviors. Uh, and again, these may vary based on what your grandchild needs. But as an example, if your grandchild yells when told when is when when they're told no um, or throws a tantrum, then what you're looking for instead is accepting being told no calmly. And 
every time that you say no, if they say, can I go outside and play right now? Can I get on my iPad? Can I have this for dessert? Can I have a little bit more at any time that you're about to say no, really, you know, get your antenna up and say, okay, did they calmly accept that and provide that praise anytime that they do? The flip side to positive attending is withdrawing your attention or active ignoring. And importantly, we want to use this only for minor misbehaviors that are reinforced by your attention. So we wouldn't want to use this if, if your grandchild is hiding under the bed because they don't want to brush their teeth. We wouldn't want to use ignoring in that case because then they're not doing the thing that you want them to do, which is brush their teeth. We use this for things that are purposely seeking your attention, things like whining, arguing, tantrums, interrupting, being purposefully annoying, using disrespectful language. Sometimes uh, families want to have a, a, a harsh or more of a consequence for that than active ignoring. Um, but these are things that are purposely trying to get on your skin or pull you in. And instead, what we're doing is we are withdrawing your attention, the food source that it's looking for. And we're waiting for good behavior to happen. And then you're going to praise it. So you're still communicating what it is that you want to see. Um, so let's say they're whining about something, you're withdrawing your attention, and then you're returning your attention when, uh, when the child is engaging in the behavior that you want to see. Um, I have an example here with whining where if you are in kind of the parenting or grandparenting as usual, the child is waiting patiently, you ignore it because you're busy taking care of your other grandchild or you have a chance to go make yourself a snack or something, right? It just seems sort of like expected behavior. Then the child whines for your attention. It's annoying or irritating. And so you respond, you get the attention. Even if you respond in a way where you say that's, you know, don't talk to me like that. That's still all press is good press. All attention is good attention. So even if it is kind of a reprimand, it still is considered attention. In this case, whining is getting reinforced. If we're using withdrawal of attention, we're going to flip it around a little bit. The child waits patiently. That's when you praise. Then they whine. You withdraw your attention. You, you, uh, and this doesn't mean that you need to walk away unless you need to regulate your own emotions. But you can kind of turn, turn your back a little bit, focus on something else, make sure you, there isn't any sort of expression that you're giving. Then they start waiting patiently. You immediately return your attention and you say, thank you so much for waiting so patiently. You know, how can I help you? In this case, you're reinforcing waiting patiently. And I love using this combination of positive attending and active ignoring because your attention is something and, and, and the, the way that you can give and take away your attention is a resource that you have available to you at any time. So it's a, it's a fantastic tool to address many behaviors. The one Warning here is that there's something called an extinction burst, which uh, means when you withdraw your attention from a behavior that used to get your attention, the problem of behavior will get worse before it gets better. So if you think about a dog who you've been feeding table food to, uh, human food to, and you decide, all right, this dog is getting too fat, I need to stop feeding them this food, and you stop, the dog is going to start to whine and maybe scratch at you and then jump up and down and then bark, right? They're going to escalate their reactions until they get what they're looking for. Importantly, you need to be ready to ignore the escalations in behavior. Otherwise, if you reinforce a higher level of that behavior, then that's the behavior that your grandchild will continue to do, um, you know, going forward. They're going to say, oh, well, it's not whining. It's actually shouting that I have to do. Um, so you have to be really ready and make sure that everybody in the child's life is on the same page and ready to engage in active ignoring before giving it a try, because that consistency is really important. Um, importantly, as I mentioned before, you would not want to ignore any uh, dangerous or destructive behavior. So you would want to make sure that your grandchild is safe. All right. Uh, the next step in our hierarchy is giving good directions. And this is not to say that I don't want you to always give good directions. It's just higher up on the hierarchy um, after some of these other strategies because we want to make sure that you're only giving directions when you absolutely need to. As I mentioned before, kids with ADHD feel like they're surrounded by these instructions all of the time and, and negative feedback all of the time. So we really want to use this sparingly only when we must get something done. So when you're giving an instruction, 
here's what to do. You want to be direct. You're telling them what you want rather than asking. So rather than, can you sit down? Please sit down. You want to phrase it positively. What to do rather than what not to do. So instead of stop running, please walk. You want to give one direction at a time. This is very important because kids with ADHD have difficulty holding on to multiple directions. So rather than get your backpack and your shoes and, oh, wait, don't forget your water bottle. We want to give just one instruction at a time. They'll be much more likely that they'll be able to comply. And then you want to be specific. So as I mentioned before, clean your room is, could mean a lot of different things. Vague things like behave, doesn't, we don't really know what that means. So you want to make sure that you're being really specific with your instructions. And then finally, make sure that your command is developmentally appropriate. So we wouldn't want to say complete math problem 17, because what if they don't know how to do that yet? Instead, you could say, please sit down in the chair, please pick up your pencil, write other behaviors that would be working toward getting that homework done. When you're delivering the instruction, you want to state it calmly and respectfully. We want to model good manners. We don't want to be reinforcing those escalation of reactions. And you want to be close to your grandchild, so you make sure that they can that they definitely heard you. We won't, don't want there to be any question about that. You want to give the direction right before you want the behavior to happen, so it's they can follow through on it right away and they won't forget about it. And you want to give them opportunity to comply. You want to wait a good five seconds before giving the before giving any sort of follow up. And uh, a lot of times we have this urge to say, come on, let's go right now. And we don't realize that we're not actually giving them that chance to do the right thing. And then when they listen, you want to praise them for listening right away. All right. Next on the hierarchy is uh, going over behavior plans and reward systems. And I'm going to go over this very briefly. If you're interested in learning more, you can um, take our webinar, child, uh, childmind.org slash best. Um, but this is just kind of a, a brief primer on what a behavior plan is. So these are targeting specific behaviors that you want to improve that haven't responded to some of those other strategies. So again, we want to use these other strategies as much as we can. And then for behaviors that continue to be a challenge, we can provide some additional incentive. If you were providing an incentive for every behavior under the sun, it would be too much for you and your grandchild to keep track of. Um, and it, we wouldn't be likely to be successful. So you're looking at one to three behaviors on any plan. And generally, you, your grandchild will be receiving points that are like cash that you redeem for rewards. Or you can set it up where it's, you know, if you do this, then you get this reward, like I mentioned with the morning routine. Um, it's important to know that behavior change doesn't happen overnight. This requires persistence, patience, and practice, both on your part, patience with yourself and with your, with your grandchild as well. It's really important to break the goal down into small steps and to start off with an achievable goal. So even if ideally you don't want there to be any tantrums ever, if your grandchild right now engages in three tantrums a day, then maybe the goal for earning a reward would be two tantrums a day or fewer. And then you can keep reducing from there. So you want to make sure that there's an early opportunity for success. Otherwise, it, they will be frustrated with the system. You're going to say this didn't work and um, it will be you know, challenging to try something else again. The other things to keep in mind are how you set up the rewards. The rewards have to be rewarding. These are things that you should select with your grandchild. And if a reward isn't motivating, then choose another. The rewards must be immediate. The closer the reward follows the behavior, the stronger the behavior change. And again, it, it provides that more immediate, instant gratification that we're looking for. You want the rewards to be contingent on the behavior. So they have to do the behavior before they get the reinforcement. We're not going to give them the reward and then make them promise that they'll do what we're expecting of them. And then we want the rewards to be consistent. Uh, you want to have multiple options of rewards or change the reward up because otherwise kids can get tired of them. Um, and again, have a variety of things that they can receive on a more daily basis, and then perhaps some longer term rewards like weekly or, or something a little bit longer. These can also be, it doesn't have to just be things. These can be privileges like getting to extend their bedtime or getting to use a screen or getting to choose what the family eats for dinner. Um, so there's lots of different options that you can choose from. And you can think about some of the things that your grandchild 
is already getting for free, um, if you will, and uh, instead have them earn it for completing certain behaviors. And then you can have some other extra stuff that they might be excited by. Finally, we're going to talk about just some guidelines for consequences of, for misbehavior. So these are not specific consequences that you can use, but again, knowing that we want that balance of warmth and limit setting, when you're administering consequences, it's important to administer them calmly. Again, we want to model the behaviors that we want to see. You want to use these sparingly. So um, you we don't want to be giving consequences all the time. This is why we talk about all these other positive strategies to utilize in conjunction with the consequences. You want these to be administered immediately after a behavior. So you want to be able to see the behavior, make sure that the behavior is clearly defined. You know, what do I mean by destroying property? Does it mean knocking a tower over or does it mean breaking a toy? Um, and you want the consequence to be given in small doses. So one of the common pitfalls with consequences is that caregivers will take something away for an a long period of time or an indefinite period of time. And then we lose the chance to maintain that motivation and it can further deteriorate um, the caregiver child relationship. You want your consequences to be consistent. As I mentioned before, these should be clearly defined for the child in advance so they know what to expect and so that you don't you know, shoot from the hip and do something um, that you might later regret. And uh, as I said before, you want these to be delivered in conjunction with positive behavior management strategies. Before wrapping up, I want to circle back to the relationship, to building that warmth and why that's so important. A positive, warm relationship with your grandchild is the foundation for setting limits and encouraging the behavior that you want to see. And one change that you can make today is starting to engage in child-led one-on-one time. This doesn't have to be anything extravagant. For younger kids, it can be just five minutes a day or however often you see your grandkids. For older kids, about 10 to 15 minutes a day. Um, and this is a chance for your grandchild to be in charge, to take the lead in the play, to choose the activity that you're engaging in, and for you to just follow their lead. So if you're drawing and they want to make a farm where a pig has a horse's head and a, you know, the, the farmer is the one who's getting milk. Right? It doesn't matter. It, do, it doesn't matter if it's accurate. It is the time for them to, you know, do what they want to do. And you're going to be following along and approving of their choices. You want to provide frequent positive feedback. So you're going to use that praise uh, during this time and, and shine your light on them. Show them, you know, when we're engaging together, I really in, enjoy this time with you and, and this can be a really positive time for both of us. You wanna actively listen and reflect back what you hear. So especially, this is really helpful at any age, but especially if your one-on-one -on -one time is gonna be more conversation-based with an older child, you want to be really tuning into what they're saying, not trying to take over the conversation or correcting anything that they're saying, but just listening and repeating it back. And you want to avoid directing, correcting, or criticizing any behavior. Um, during this time, you want to ignore minor misbehavior. You would end the play for any aggression or destruction. And again, make sure that everybody's safe. Um, but other things that might be trying to get under your skin, like using some inappropriate potty language or something like that, we would ignore that and just focus on the behaviors that you enjoy seeing. Um, doing this is like brushing your teeth to prevent cavities. You are investing this time with your grandchild so that you can give them more positive feedback so that you can enjoy your time with them so that they can enjoy being with you. And again, setting limits later will be much easier. Here are some additional resources that you can check out. I mentioned before, childmind.org slash best will have more information, um, expand upon many of the strategies that I previewed here today. And then the strategies in this presentation are drawn from evidence-based behavioral parent training interventions. They have accompanying caregiver resources that I've listed here that you're welcome to check out. And if you are interested this summer, the Child Mind Institute is running a summer program that is the only therapeutic program of its kind in the New York City area for kids with ADHD and other behavioral learning and social needs. So um, I encourage you to snap that QR code if you are interested in learning more. And thank you so much for your time and attention today. I look forward to hearing your questions. 
Dr. Mendel, thank you so much. Um, we've received some great questions from our listeners, so let's get right to them. Um, um, so someone asked, how can we bridge the generation gap with our grandchild and also with the parents of their friends who are so much younger than us? Gotcha. Okay. So you're a grandchild. I'm, I'm assuming this is coming from a grandparent raising their kids and, and um, yes. being in a community where they're with other parents. It's a great question, and I think it's particularly hard um, for grandparents of a kid with ADHD, because, most likely because that child requires even more energy from you, and you know, even even more of that that input. Um, I think finding the ways when I what I just mentioned about the one on one time, you know, there there may not be the possibility to engage in all of the things that your child is hoping, your grandchild is hoping you'll be able to do. Um, but being able to give them that sort of controlled choice in, in there where you can identify, okay, well, I really enjoy, I can sit down and do some art activities with them. And what are some ways that we can bring in materials that make it exciting for them? And it's still an activity that I can, you know, comfortably do. Um, in terms of support, I would say just try to find other grandparents, even if they're not the sole caregivers, just finding other grandparents who you can connect with. And generally, kids enjoy being, you know, in any space where they can connect with peers. So if you are able to find other other grandparents who you can hang out with at the playground or something, I think that that would that would be wonderful. Um, someone writes, so much has changed since our adult son was diagnosed with ADHD. What are some of the biggest changes in managing ADHD that we should be aware of today? That's a great question. Um, so I think we we know a lot more in terms of the uh, the behavioral interventions that are effective. And again, I've um, mentioned some of the ways that this can influence your parenting or grandparenting over time. Um, but again, having that kind of balance of warmth and limit setting, I think is, is really key. Um, and, and, and I also think positively that there's been more awareness about ADHD, but there still is the need to educate people in your grandchild's life about what ADHD is. So, uh, while there's a lot of great information about the fact that ADHD, as I mentioned before, is real common and treatable. Sometimes you as the advocate do still need to provide that information for teachers, camp counselors, uh, friends, parents, et cetera. So um, I, it sounds like you've been, you have a lot of this information and I would just encourage you to not be afraid to share it with the people um, in your child's life and, and do that advocacy for them. Um, we have this question and we have various um, versions of it. I watch my grandchildren after school and getting them to do homework is agonizing. I'm not sure how to dole out or enforce consequences when they later go home with their parents. That is a great question. So um, if we think about that hierarchy, I encourage you to, we'll just pull it up here. Um, I encourage you to think about what you can do during homework time to set the stage for success. So using those strategies that I mentioned of having some kind of homework checklist about what needs to get done, having that good space for homework completion, um, having a timer, breaking tasks down, et cetera, then providing frequent praise for those behaviors, using those good directions, again, not related to the academics, but related to the behaviors surrounding the academics, and then probably setting up some sort of reinforcement. So when they complete this their homework, then they can earn something um, that they're looking forward to. And in terms of consequences, I probably wouldn't have a, a, a traditional consequence like a, a timeout or something like that. But I would say that, you know, certain rewarding activities will be withheld until homework is complete. And you're absolutely right that, you know, if you're expected to do it with them and then they go home and they still haven't done it, but the parent says, okay, sure, you can you know, go on your screen, I think having that conversation and saying it's really important that we're on the same page, you know, we're not going to give this reward or this um, privilege until the homework is complete and making sure that they're able to follow through on it as well. 
Um, what are some strategies to de-escalate the outsized emotions of teens with ADHD? Um, another great question. One of the things that I, I didn't mention much in, in my sort of intro is that one of the the features that we see in kids with ADHD that is not a symptom in our diagnostic and statistical manual is difficulties with emotion regulation. That, you know, the, and this makes sense because it's more of that sort of impulsive responding and, and difficulty regulating some of those emotional responses. So definitely something that we see a lot, whether it's teens or kids um, with ADHD having difficulty regulating some of those emotions. And I would say, again, thinking about this hierarchy, think about the ways that you can prevent those escalations from happening in the first place. One would be through having that one-on-one -on -one time with your teen, engaging in that active listening and, and reflecting back what you hear and attending to some of those lower levels of emotional expression. Sometimes we end up saying things bigger and louder and stronger because we feel like the other person isn't hearing us. And so if you're able to validate those feelings and recognize those feelings when they're um, kind of little embers as opposed to big flames, you're going to be much more likely to prevent the the need to for, for that teen to have more of an explosive reaction. Um, we have one person writing, my 18-year-old grandson was diagnosed as a child, and I was just diagnosed at age 62, which, of course, we hear more about older adults being diagnosed mm -hmm. these days. He has decided to stop seeing his psychiatrist and to stop taking his meds. I shared with him that I was recently diagnosed, and we began to help each other with our behaviors, but how can I help him to re-engage with his doctor and to start taking his meds again? It's a great question. And I think you're already doing a, a great job of being open. And, you know, I talked before about modeling the behaviors you want to see. So you're sharing you know, your own vulnerabilities and what's challenging for you and the things that you're doing. And I think it's important to note that, you know, one strategy may work for somebody, but not for another. I think just continuing to have those conversations with uh, your grandson will be helpful. Um, it's not something where, especially as, as our kids grow up and become adolescents, this is something very common that we see um, where they're more reluctant to take their medication. And I think it's, it, it, the, the change and the, the motivation really needs to come from, from them where they can see, oh, you know, this is helpful to me. Um, and this is something that I want to do. So just, you know, continuing to help your grandson see the ways in which medication can be helpful um, without making him feel like he's being forced or, or pushed to do it. I think you're going to um, likely see more change there. Okay. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, so, um, a few people wrote about their kids in elementary school. Um, they say that their kids are picking on other children, that they're actually bullying and they're getting calls from school administrators how can they deal with that kind of behavior? Um, this is where I think the homeschool partnership is really important. And it is, it, it's a, a tough place to be in because, you know, it, it is, it is a place where, you know, no one ever wants to get that call from the school. Um, but as much as you can work with the school to ask them how you can support your grandchild um, and what you can do to encourage them to engage in appropriate behaviors uh, from home, the better. But as I mentioned, kids really benefit from that reinforcement at the point of performance. So in-school interventions are really going to be key here. And so working with the school to say, okay, how can we partner? But what are some of the things that, how can I help you with implementing some of these interventions at school to ensure that they're um, doing the right thing. And so that may be um, learning more appropriate strategies for engaging with peers and then getting reinforcement for using those more appropriate strategies as opposed to something more maladaptive like bullying. And then, of course, the school may have their own protocol when it comes to you know how they handle bullying and certain consequences that might be put into place. Um, someone asked, what are some good ways to help children wind down when they come home from school? Um, I get this one a lot. Uh, I would say 
a lot of times kids do need that time to wind down. And, you know, especially before entering into homework, they don't want to go right from school into doing homework. And it's just, it's very taxing to do that. Um, so you, it is good to have some downtime. I would make sure that it's very structured and clear. Um, and that you say, okay, you get 30 minutes of downtime. Um, I would specify what activities can and can't be utilized during that time. Typically I say no screens until homework is done. Um, it's also going to be harder to get your grandchild off of the screen and onto something else. Um, but I think other than, other than that, I would work with your grandchild to see some of the things that they might enjoy. It's a great opportunity to give choice within something that you want to see, right? So your rule is no screens during this time, or it has to only be 30 minutes before we get to the other stuff. But you know, what are some things that let's brainstorm together? What are some activities that you might want to engage in? Um, we have this question, what would be some ways to support an adult child with ADHD living away from home, but looking for support when their impulsiveness gets them into a situation and they're looking for help, such as overspending or requesting too much time away from work? Gotcha. Well, I think it's wonderful that they're asking for help. So that is a, a great um, first sign. And I would, you know, again, look at this hierarchy and think about working more with the person, right? So a lot of what we talked about was you as, as uh, grandparents of younger kids kind of putting things into place, but you can more collaboratively work with your older um, grandchild to ask about, okay, well, what's, what, keep, what behavior keeps happening? Why does that keep getting in the way? What are some things that we can do to support you? And I think, you know, having that more proactive conversation um, to problem solve and to see what other supports might be able, might, you might be able to put into place. Again, there's no kind of one size fits all, but if you're able to have them say, oh, you know what, it would be helpful if you called me to, you know, check in about this, that, and the other thing, or, um, you know, it would be helpful for me to, you know, I, oh, I could set up this reward for myself for, you know, meeting a particular goal. Um, so again, I would make it very collaborative and, and especially since they're asking for help, we want them to really generate the solution. Okay. Um, someone else asks, we're raising our grandson who is now 16. He acts very aggressively with his emotions. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to spend quality time with him because he spends lots of time in his room online with his school friends. We have lots of arguments when we try to address the amount of time he spends on screens. It's difficult to have any kind of reasonable discussions. How do we make, how do we make him understand the negative effects of so much screen time? Yeah, this can be very challenging and something that we hear a lot. Um, kids will often retreat into the world of video games. It is a social outlet for many kids and teens and, um, and it can, it can be hard to kind of pull away from that. Um, the, the first is again, the, the, the idea of this balance of warmth and limit setting there, there may be certain limits that are appropriate to put into place here in terms of the amount of time that they can have access to it or the things that need to get done before they have access to those video games. So even though they're older, there are still certain things that you can do to kind of control the amount of use. Um, and I think the, it, it's, it's going to be challenging. You mentioned a lot of the, the challenges with engaging with him and having any sort of positive interaction. I think at this point, him hearing from you kind of the negative, the, the downsides of it, he's probably likely not there yet. Um, but I would think about using that one-on-one -on -one time. And even if right now that just means that you're kind of sitting with him while he's playing video games and you're, you know, it's, it's not the ideal scenario, but if that's really the only place where he's willing to interact with you, then I would start there and you can, you know, describe those behaviors that is, is describe what he's doing. Um, you know, you can show interest in what he's doing. And again, this might open up a bit of a theme where rather than it being like, I'm pro video game and we're, you know, you as the grandparents are against video games, you can start to see some of the value and he can say, okay, you know, I, I see that you're willing to meet me where I am. You see some of the value in what I'm, I'm doing here. Um, and it may be more likely for him to then open up and talk with you about 
some of the the cons related to video gaming. But I do think that we you need to create some of those themes, um, perhaps with that one on one time. Okay. Well, unfortunately, that has to be the last question because we're out of time. But we thank you so much for joining us today and for contributing your expertise to our ADHD community. And make sure you don't miss future Attitude webinars, articles, or research updates by signing up to receive our free email newsletters at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. If you're listening in replay or podcast mode, visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 452 to access the slides, the video replay, the certificate of attendance option, and the webinar transcript. And if you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe. Thanks, everyone. For more Attitude podcasts and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.